Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. We'd like to give a special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. And for more information about Perpetual Chess, you can go to PerpetualChessPod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Before we introduce our guest this week, I wanted to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. Chessable is dropping new courses all the time to help you with any aspect of your game. I myself have been checking out the Ready Nimzowicz Larson Attack by F.M. Dalton Perrine and Grandmaster Yaroslav Zhera book. This is a great choice if you're looking for something solid um, with some Hidden Venom, but not too theoretical. It's a great choice if you're playing a lot of kids in tournaments, hypothetically speaking. Uh, so I've been playing that opening anyway, so super excited to check out the course. Uh, Eugene Perlstein has a new course on the Hyper Accelerated Dragon. Eugene has been developing the theory of this opening for as long as I can remember. I also wanted to give a quick shout out to Grandmaster Daniel King, who is coming soon to Perpetual Chess. Always a popular guest. He's going to help me preview the FIDE World Championship. But before then, on March 24th, he will be giving a masterclass with Chessable on using the outpost. So if you're interested in potentially taking Grandmaster King's class, then check out the show notes. And with for, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest for this week, who is one of my favorite modern authors. Um, he has written a book called On the Origin of Good Moves, which traces the evolution of chess, one of my personal favorites. He also wrote Move First, Think Later, which was the ECF book of the year. And he is out with a new book called Ink War, which covers the first world championship match between Steinitz and Zuckertor. And um, it's a lot of fun to read. I mean, it really takes you behind the scenes. These were some fascinating characters. And our guest is actually also a top Dutch player, but also an accomplished improver. He didn't start chess till the age of 12, reached Great Heights uh, has two GM norms to go along with his IM title. So we are pleased to welcome back to the show, I am Willie Hendricks. Thank you, Ben, and nice to be here back. Yes, great to catch up. Uh, as, as is customary, I finished your book just in time, a couple of days before mm -hmm. our interview. I've been greatly uh, enjoying it. It's, um, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, it's uh, a little bit different than your prior books, a little bit more historic based, although has some of your, uh, your hallmark uh, um, tools in writing as well. Um, but first, Willie, let's talk about your chess, because when we last spoke, it was 2020. You had just finished a big chess project. And as we wrapped up, you said now that you were done with this book, you were hoping to play a bit more chess. Um, I checked out your FIDE profile, and it looks like you're playing some league games. But I'm curious, from your perspective, what is going on with your chess? Well, uh, actually, not that much, unfortunately. Uh... I, indeed, I played a few league game, games, but that's that's all. Uh, I think we, like a, a lot of players, the, the pandemic, of course, uh, had, a, had an influence. And after that, uh, well, I'm a bit uh, in doubt what, what to do. I haven't played any uh, tournaments uh, uh, before. I, I was used to play, say, three serious tournaments a year or maybe four. But... Uh, uh, and what's, what uh, keeps me back a bit is also that I, I have have to do some serious uh, work uh, before I can enter a serious tournament arena. So, uh, uh, so it's it's a bit uh, not that much is happening. So only I I've only played a few well uh, one league game uh, every month. I play. Uh, and that's that's it for the moment. So if I want to uh, serious start again uh, playing tournaments, I'll I'll have to do some serious work. Uh, for because even for me, I'm, 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 of course, I'm not an elite player who has to work really hard nowadays. But even at my level, uh, some work has to be done, and uh, I'm a bit uh, how do you say that trailing behind, uh, lagging behind in in, in this uh, area. Yeah, I can certainly relate to that, Willie. As we record this on March 9th, I'm heading to a tournament tonight. Um, and uh. I'm going almost, I'm going to Alto in Charlotte, which is an adult only tournament here. It will long since happen by the time this interview comes out. But I've been really busy lately. I'm, I'm working on a book. So my chess study has been a, an all time low. 
Um, but I wanted to play in this tournament. I wanted to, to meet the people in Charlotte. But I mm -hmm. could tell you the feeling of going to a tournament and feeling like you're not prepared is not a good one. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, indeed. For me, it's... it's uh, uh, I decide so not to go to the tournament <laughs> right <laughs> until I'm ready so I wish you good luck with uh, <laughs> yeah, being I'm so uh, unprepared but uh, it's 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 difficult uh, e uh, well uh, some work has to be done but I'm still uh, in my mind uh, I still have the idea of re-entering uh, uh, some sort of serious uh, chess uh, yeah, and go and going to a tournament unprepared, I do feel like it lets you build the skill of sort of uh, forgiveness and disassociation. Which, as you get older, and you know, you're not playing mm -hmm. for for rent money. Yeah, you're just playing to stay sharp and to enjoy yourself. It's a, it's an important skill to cultivate. Yeah. Yes. So, so Willie, um, you're a chess trainer, and obviously you've written some incredible books on the topic of chess learning. But one thing we didn't talk about so much in our last interview, we, we got into sort of the overall theses of your landmark books. But I was curious if you think if you feel like through all of your writing, all of your research, and of course, you're becoming a very strong player yourself, do you have an overall chess improvement philosophy? Well, uh, a, a basic idea of all my books is that uh, uh, chess quality is based in quantity, and that's not a very uh, <laughs> uh, uh, idea that it, it, it's uh, so it's very aver averse to the idea of the. Well, maybe you expected me to to tell the big secret uh, <laughs> and. Uh, which uh, which I'm not uh, the only one who says that uh, the, the big secret is that there are no secrets at all. And uh, and I think uh, that's also the way, the way you can compare human thinking with uh, the, the engine way of thinking. Both have in common that uh, the quality that comes out is based on quantity. And uh, so... Uh, you really have to work hard and do all those different different things. And I, I and I, nowadays there are a lot of uh, 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 there's there's a lot of very good material to to improve in chess. And uh, and of course you should choose the smartest uh, the smartest ones. But I think uh, everyone who who, who, who who wants to work hard? Uh, there's so much uh, good, good uh, material nowadays that uh, uh, I think everyone can get the most out of his uh, his or her, her talents. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I think a bit uh, of challenge. I, I, I've maybe a bit disappointing as an overall <laughs> philosophy. I can tell you a bit more about it because it's it's uh, it's a. Uh, in some senses, it's a bit contrary to some traditional ways of looking at the chess improvement. But uh, so, uh, for for one for an example, uh, just to add something, because otherwise, my my uh, what I just said sounds a bit uh, is uh, a bit poverish. How do you say that? Uh, um, for example, the idea of uh, that you can improve by. Uh, uh, learning how to make plans. That's a very popular idea in chess uh, uh, improvement history. Uh, and a lot of book offers, uh, uh, offer, uh, a lot of books offer, offer ways of how to make plans and study the characteristics of a position, of a position and then, um, uh, uh, and, and then, uh, and then make a plan on the basis of, of them. Uh, whereas I think that's, it's not about learning to make plans, but about learning a lot of plans. So that's a difference. And uh, oh, that's an, that's an interesting and distinction. Like like the way, uh, and that's also in, in, in tactics. Uh, when you study tactics, it's much more usual to to say uh, to someone when, uh, to someone you well, you have to see and study all those different tactics. And I think likewise with plans, you simply have to learn all the, uh, well. Uh, yeah, learn all those different plans, and uh, instead of uh, some kind of uh, magical way of uh, of uh, of uh, extracting those plans out of the the study of the characteristics of a position. 
But some okay, more, maybe we'll... Uh, so more of a top-down approach than a bottom-up in terms of coming up with plans? Well, my approach is the, the bottom-up uh, approach, I would but say. But it sounds <laughs> like you're saying... In in a give say you're studying a certain opening, you should know the you should learn the specific plans from the 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 strong players that have played it before. Um, is is that am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, that, it, and and that there's no secret way of uh, of finding those uh, all those strategical uh, ideas and maneuvers and plans from from looking good at the characteristics of the position. That's a. Uh, that's the okay. difference. So, and that's the quantity. Uh, everybody agrees you have to uh, a lot of quantity regarding uh, uh, tactics. You do have to do all this this work and get acquainted with all those different forms of tactics. And I think uh, strategy plans, uh, um, strat uh, strategic maneuvers. It's it's just the same way. Yeah? You have to take in all those different. Uh, typical ways of playing and uh, and not bother with uh, some kind of secret po protocol to to, <laughs> to to study the position and and and, uh, and find and, the right plan and how would you recommend uh, amateur players uh, go about learning these plans well I, I think uh, I think we dis discussed this uh, before that studying openings is a, uh, is a very good way to uh, get acquainted with typical plans. Uh, and that, that also has the advantage of uh, uh, the, the, the direct feedback. You study an opening uh, from a, uh, well, uh, whatever way you study it, whatever source, uh, you get acquainted with some ideas. You start playing on, on the internet. Uh, and you look back at your games, and maybe uh, uh, so it, it's it's the uh, you start with a few plans in an opening, but because it's uh, but because you, you're sure you will have that opening on the board in your games, it's it's very rewarding because you'll you'll get direct feedback, and so that's a way to slowly uh, uh, build up your opening and your repertoire, and you'll meet new ideas. Uh, you start with very little. You start playing, and uh, maybe on the basis of that, you 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 got a position on the board, and you didn't know what to do next. Now maybe you can look up a few games with uh, from from strong players uh, uh, with that position, or uh, so, uh, or, or you can look up in a book, or, or in, in maybe in a in a course you followed. So I think that. Uh, to start to to take you the openings you play as as the the, the basis from from which you build on, uh, I think that's a very good idea to to uh, build up your strategical knowledge. Great advice, yeah. And as we mentioned in our last conversation, you really changed my thinking about that. I had been a bit dogmatically preaching that, um, especially um, lower rated adult amateurs study too many openings now. That still may be true in some cases, but I think your broader point of the, of the, the value that can be gained by studying openings um, and, as you say, studying uh, structures and plans in particular, um, it, it's I've certainly come around to your, your school of thought there. Um, and one more follow-up on this topic, Willie. These days, I mean, as you alluded to, there's so much to choose from. And uh, in addition to studying plans, these days, like on Lee Chess, for example, you can look for tactics within your opening. You can filter mm -hmm. their puzzle explorer for tactics from your opening. Is that a way that you would advocate studying as well? Uh, I tried it a few times, but uh, I, I think so. It, it looks it looks, uh, it looks very sensible. Uh, but uh, I'm, uh, there is so much on this, this uh, in this area developing so quickly, and I'm not not an expert on that. Uh, so uh, I saw that uh, Lee Chess function, uh, but of course, in, in all other, uh, there was there is so much uh, on, on in this area developing at the moment, uh, uh, and I don't keep uh, track of it. Uh, yeah, it's a but lot. But <laughs> I'm sure it's I'm sure there are a lot of very. Uh, useful functions and and these these tactics uh, well 
in the earlier days, there was uh, opening books with uh, uh, tactics and this and that opening, uh, 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 which, uh, and, but, but now the, in, 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 uh, in this, this way, this, this uh, functions, of course, uh, much uh, quicker and, and, and better, but uh, yeah. And it, let me ask you, Willie, so I know that you're a chess trainer. Uh, last time we talked, you mentioned you do, or at least at the time, we're doing some casual adult classes. Um, but what is your day to day like? Are you doing one on one lessons? Are you doing group lessons? Are you working with top youth? Like what is the um, majority of your chess teaching work uh, entail? I'm not doing that much uh, training at the moment, but mostly is group uh, group training, uh, adults and youth. But uh, I'm, I'm not doing that much uh, anymore. And I'm more into uh, at the moment writing uh, writing on chess but uh, that's my main uh, my main uh, occupation occupation at the moment uh, excellent well we are we are certainly glad uh that that you're spending the time i mean something like this this project on the ink war where you're sort of doing original research and um you know um tipping over sacred cows, I guess you could say like you're you know you're you're revealing sort of received wisdom that has may have may be false that's been passed down for generations but um before we dig into that we should probably give a bigger picture view on the ink war um so i think i might know the answer to this but uh what was the beginnings of this project so how did this idea to write about and we should say it's about the steinitz zuckerter first world championship match in the 19th century but they're fascinating personalities and uh I am Hendrix covers the whole buildup to the match. Um, so, what what led to this project, Willie? Well, it it builds forth on my previous book on the origin of good moves, and um, uh, in it, Zukertort plays a small role. Uh, uh, Zukertort, you can say, is the tragic hero of of my new book, but he also played a, a role in in uh, that earlier book, and. Uh, I gave a lecture on that book uh, for a uh, Dutch chess club named after after Zukertort, uh, the Zukertort Amstelveen Chess Club. And and then uh, slowly slowly I got the idea when, when preparing for that uh, lecture that this match and and the whole uh, everything that uh, went before it that led to the to the match uh, that that was a very nice way to to tell the story of how uh, modern chess uh, uh, developed uh, and also my second idea was not only to give a picture of how uh, how uh, of, of the birth of modern chess but also i got the idea that it would be possible to tell it as an as an interesting uh, compelling story uh, 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 well, not really a, a thriller or a detective, but a, a somehow a, a, a captivating, captivating story. That was that were the two ideas. So uh, the team, the teams that I discuss, our, uh, our, I also some of them I already addressed in my previous book, but it's also the the. the uh, uh, telling the story, which was what was for me and. Well, I hope I, I could get a, get that uh, done uh, to, yeah, to, you, to make a compelling story out of it. Yeah, what you definitely did. I'm I'm always impressed that uh, that you're writing in English. You're writing in your second language, and you're a very um, very good writer. Greatly enjoyed it. I just want to give our listeners a few more facts. I always try to tell them like where they can get a book, what rating range. So uh, number one, we should say uh, Willie's book is available from New and Chess. New and Chess is also publishing my book, but I select who I interview independently, and obviously we'll be uh, interviewing. Um, I have interviews planned with authors from all publishers, and and that will continue. Um, but we should say Willie's book is available in Kindle. It's available on the New In Chess app, and obviously it's available in book form as well. Um, and uh, we have a listener question. Oh, and for, in terms of a uh, rating range, I always like to give listeners a little guidance. Uh, that's one thing that I can say is a real benefit of your book. Um, number one, a wide range of chess fans can appreciate it. Um, there's tons of diagrams. The explanations are good. So, I mean, if you're rated 1,200, some of the chess may go over your head, but you will have no problem 
reading the book and uh, following the explanations for the puzzles presented. And obviously, uh, as you move up the rating scale, uh, you can enjoy the book um, all the more. Now, we've got a listener question. Oh, and la last thing to add is this is a book that can be read um, without a chess set, I would say. I read it on, I read it on Kindle um, and never took out a set. And I may have missed a few things here and there, a few details I would have enjoyed more. But generally, it's a good chess bedtide, bedside reading. Um, so question about the context of the match, since uh, this is from Roy Lopes, uh, supporter of the podcast. Thank you for submitting the question and for supporting the podcast, Roy. Uh, and he he goes straight to sort of the, what you build up to the main event, uh, which again is the world championship, <clears throat> excuse me, between Zuckerta and Steinitz. Uh, so Roy writes, he says, in 1886, Zuckerta was leading four to one after just five games, but eventually lost the match. So his first question is, did you find any clues that explain such a turn of events, but apart from the tenacity of Steinitz? And his second question is, in, in your opinion, what are the most innovative contributions of Zucker to, to modern chess? Uh, well, that's uh, two uh, good questions. Uh, well, uh, uh, one point that played a... Uh, uh, Probably an important role in the match was uh, Zuckertot's health situation. He he had uh, health problems uh, during all his life, and um, uh, the, the the match was in uh, was uh, organized in three different cities. It started in New York, and uh, Zuckertot was doing very well. Uh, uh, when they left New York, he was uh, four to one uh, leading. Uh, then they went to. Uh, uh, I think New Orleans, that was the second city, uh, and they ended in St. Louis. Um, or other, other, <laughs> other way around, I'm not, I'm also, I'm not that strong in the, uh, but anyway, uh, in this uh, second part, he, he already got some health problems, but, uh, but he, he claimed, especially in the last part, he got really sick, uh, he Zuckertot himself said he had uh, malaria, um, and uh, at the end he, he really he completely collapsed. Uh, uh, I personally think Steinitz was the stronger player, anyhow, but uh, uh, but quite likely uh, uh, his, his poor health uh, did uh, uh, did Zuckertot much harm. And as we all know, uh, he he, o he only lived. Uh, uh, two years after the match, uh, and then he he died of uh, 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 problems with his uh, heart and uh, uh, vascular problems he, he had. So uh, I make the somewhat uh, uh, typical remark that Zuckertort proved more or less by the way he died that uh, indeed his his health did play a role in that match because uh, Steinitz did, did try to downplay that a, a little bit, which is understandable because it's, 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 if, if you have won a world champion match and nobody, nobody wants to hear that it's because the, the opponent wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't in good shape. So, uh, so th that's an answer to the, the first question. But I think Steinitz was the stronger player, but it's clear that Zuckertort uh, collapsed. Um, uh, the second question was what uh, the most innovative contributions of uh, Zuckertar to my Zuckertar in his whole life. Yeah, well, a major topic in in my book is of course the uh, uh, it, what in the subtitle is, is uh, I call rom romanticism versus modern modernity, and uh, the big the bigger story of uh, how modern chess. Uh, uh, came into being. There is this mythological story that Steinitz uh, either uh, discovered or, 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 or uh, invented uh, uh, modern positional chess. And in, in the, those the, these accounts of chess history, Zuckertort is put in the opposing wall. He's the anti-hero who, who uh, uh, has to uh, uh, represent the... Uh, the old attacking school, the the romantic chess, which which you can, uh, uh, which is characterized by the idea of uh, attack at all costs. That's the basic uh, 
Uh, that, that's uh, romanticism. Caricature uh, of romantic chess. And this, that's, that story is completely false, I would say, on all accounts. And especially, it's, it's especially very sad for Zuckertort, who, who wanted to be a modern chess player himself. So he didn't uh, look at him at all as, as being a re representative of the old attacking school. And, uh, and I think that's completely correct. Zuckertot was a, was a modern player. And for example, he, uh, he uh, at that time, uh, uh, the great majority of games were, were open games, so E4, E5. And Zuckertot... Uh, experimented a lot with d4 openings or starting with knight f3 or sometimes e3 but basically uh, d4 openings uh, and then he also tried to to play on the queen side uh, so uh, uh, there are some uh, there are quite a few games with Zuckertort playing on the queen side and he had his own special plan with uh, trying to play c5 and then uh, have a, a pawn uh, avalanche on the, on the queen side. That was a very typical strategy uh, Zuckertort uh, often tried. And that's, of course, a very modern uh, uh, strategy. Uh, if you look at, at the textbooks, uh, the idea of a pawn majority on the queen side that plays an important role. Uh, today, not so much as as, uh, as in the earlier days. But if, if you uh, look at an old... At those old um, manuals on chess strategy, this idea of the pawn majority on the queen side, that's really a, a, a very big uh, a big theme. And Zuckertort more or less was one of the first uh, uh, players who regularly uh, demonstrated that. Uh, so that's one thing I think uh, yeah, there, there are many. Zuckertot has left us, and which is typical modern modern uh, idea. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much to learn from both players, but you certainly make a convincing case that, uh, as you say in the book, as the saying goes, history is written by the winners, and the fact that Steinitz uh, won the match definitely seems to have impacted the way that the story of the the development of of chess gets told. Now, you single out, I believe, both in uh, on, on the origin of good moves and in this book. You mentioned uh, Lasker's manual of chess in particular and Lasker's writing in general as having sort of an outsized influence on how uh, how chess history has been told in subsequent years. Willie, uh, what, what led you to that observation? How did you manage to put that piece of the puzzle in place? Um. Well, that's that's a difficult uh, uh, question. Um, uh, first of all, to to explain it a, a little bit, uh, Lasker was of course a, a tremendous player, and uh, he, he also excelled in a lot of other fields. But I think his uh, views on chess history are really uh, well have have damaged, uh, have, have brought a complete false picture in, into the world, and. Um, I, and Lasker is not the only one who uh, uh, who was, uh, but he is my main culprit uh, in this case. Uh, and later on, I think Ewe has contributed a lot, and also uh, Reti ha had some influence. Uh, but I guess that Lasker is the, the 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 main man who who brought this idea of uh, in the world that Steinitz was the great inventor of positional chess and that before Steinitz they played some kind of silly uh, uh, attacking chess with uh, which was purely based on intuition and and uh, and uh, uh, whatever came at them uh, in the moment at the, at the moment that was um, uh, uh, that was the way they played a very primitive uh, uh, a very primitive way of playing and uh, uh, I think that uh, Lasker is the main uh, the, the main culprit here, and and it is diff difficult why uh, uh, why he chose that. And there, there has been written so a few things about it. But Steinitz himself already was, of course, uh, a big advocate of his own uh, uh, theories and of his uh, uh, status. Um, I, I mention in the book, and this is that's a very important. Uh, Point to understand this period of uh, chess history is that these people had to fight very hard for their 
reputations uh, because there, there, there were few tournaments uh, rating didn't exist yet so if you were one of the strongest or maybe the, the strongest player of the moment you had to, to fight for, for that uh, yourself which is nowadays that is uh, well completely unthinkable nobody yeah. um, will doubt uh, who, who is the best and if I claim that I have some chances against the Carlson you yeah well you would l laugh at me uh, uh, right completely <laughs> justified so uh, already Steinitz uh, was, uh, uh, and Steinitz had also great ambition. So he, he, he constantly talked about his new school, his, the modern school, he said. Uh, and later on, Lasker made something very different of it. That, that's the, that's the, well, that's a, a difficult part of the story. But uh, Steinitz had his great claims and Lasker made something very different out of that. Uh, but, but surely uh, for Lasker, Steinitz was the great hero. And, uh, uh, and that fitted in also well, very well with Lasker's own philosophy because L Lasker also had uh, ambitions on, uh, on, uh, on, on, in philosophy. Uh, he wrote several books on philosophy and, uh, uh, and somehow uh, Steinitz fitted in very well with, with Lasker's own, own ideas. So uh, if you read Lasker... Uh, I think you cannot take it very seriously, but somehow everyone has taken the Lasker very seriously. And what I would say is almost a fairy tale, if you read Lasker, uh, that has become mainstream chess uh, history. So uh, that's what, what I try to describe in this book. But uh, how that exactly went, I'm not completely sure, but that's my educated guess that, uh, that Lasker has been... Uh, uh, for the largest part responsible for the way we look at history. And uh, for Zuckertort, this that, that was very sad because uh, Lasker had Steinitz, who was his hero. And so it, uh, it, was, it, it was very nice for Lasker's story that, uh, that uh, Zuckertort uh, could take the other role, the, the role of the... Uh, the villain, uh, yeah. <clears throat> the, 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 uh, that Zuckertort would represent the, the old fashioned uh, chess that uh, Steinitz uh, put an end to. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, for Zuckertort, that was uh, for, uh, for Zuckertort's reputation, reputation uh, Lasker was really the, the. Okay. Yeah. I, I read Lasker's Manual of Chess, but funny, you should mention Richard Reddy. I've also mentioned many times on the pod, uh, Masters of the Chessboard was a formative book for me by, by Reddy as well. And I certainly remember him teaching in that book that, yeah, Steinitz invented positional chess. Uh, so it, it, it's interesting. And of course, when you think about it, not surprising to, to, to understand that things are more nuanced than that. Um, but, but I and many others, of course, definitely, um, were influenced by those writings. Um, now, we should talk a bit about the title because you mentioned, of course, uh, that these guys had to be advocates for themselves. And one mm -hmm. thing that's striking through the book is just how difficult their lives are compared to modern chess professionals. Um, perhaps we'll return to that. But first, um, Willie, it would probably be helpful for listeners if you explain the so the idea behind the title, The Ink War. Yes, uh, The Ink War, yeah. And uh, some say The Ink War. So the, uh, but uh, it, the, this specific name is used for a specific episode, mostly um, when uh, between Zuckertort and Steinitz, it really became, the fighting became became really very intense and it was mainly fighting on paper. So uh, uh, fighting in uh, chess uh, columns and, and chess magazines. And um, But for me, it... it, 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 it very well captures the overall theme of my book. And uh, that's what you just said, that people had to fight very hard for their repu reputation and for the, uh, for the also not only for uh, who is the best player, but also for their ideas. Uh, and uh, we just uh, mentioned uh, Steinitz had very clear ideas and he saw himself as the uh, spokesman or the inventor of a new modern uh, playing style. Um, so both ideas and who was the strongest and 
because there were, was no rating, no engines, which is also very important. Uh, so the, they could also uh, uh, discuss uh, at length uh, positions or moves uh, uh, because there were no uh, uh, there was no engine who give a, who could give the final uh, verdict. And that's actually what I very much like about uh, this period in chess, that those people had to had the opportunity to to make war with each other about uh, on ideas and on uh, uh, on moves and and openings and and games. Nowadays there is so little discussion possible because well the the engine uh, speaks gives the final verdict and uh, it's it's so that's a bit the the. Uh, uh, how do you say that uh, the the lost world uh, uh, part of my book? I'm I'm looking back with some melancholy uh, feelings or about, about a, a, a part of chess culture that has uh, gone away. But uh, to answer your question about the ink war, uh, at some point uh, uh, Zukertot played a match against uh, Blackburn. Uh, Zukertot won that match. And Steinitz, uh, who had a, a famous uh, chess column in, in, a, in a newspaper, uh, The Field, he, uh, he commented upon all those games. And, uh, well, Zuckertort uh, had his, uh, at the time had his own magazine, The Chess Monthly, and Zuckertort reacted on those analyses by, uh, by Steinitz. And maybe Zuckertort was a bit... Uh, well, he had won that match. Maybe he was becoming a bit more uh, uh, optimistic or self, uh, self-assured. self Anyway, he criticized Steinitz a few times and uh, a bit too much according to Steinitz. So Steinitz sent a letter to, uh, to Zuckertort's magazine complaining about the way Zuckertort uh, treated his, his, his anal- anal- analysis in, uh, in his magazine. Uh, and that was that letter from Steinitz was uh, six pages uh, at least because one of the problems Steinitz had is he had he, he could not uh, uh, how do you say that he could he could not limit himself uh, so if Steinitz had some complaints he he always needed to address every single point he right. disagreed with uh, yeah. so in <laughs> reaction to the letter of Steinitz Zuckertort in his magazine. Uh, uh, wrote the piece and that was even even more voluminous and and he made also some kind of contest out of it and the the big letters on the on the front were of, uh, 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 the chess monthly versus the field uh, and according to Zuckertort the final score was uh, uh, 10 to 1 in his own uh, uh, in his own advantage so he made some kind of an analytical contest out of it and he said, well, uh, he, he proved, he, he claimed to have proven that he was right in almost all cases. And uh, so he, he, he made a bit of fool of Steinitz. And then, well, then really war broke loose. And uh, uh, so Steinitz then reacted, but not anymore in the Chess Monthly. Uh, China, uh, Steinitz rightly decided, well, uh, there I have nothing to win anymore. So he, he reacted in another chess magazine. Uh, uh, and that again was an enormous. Uh, uh, it, 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 it took him, uh, I think, uh, seven numbers of that magazine to react on all all Zuckertot's uh, uh, claims. But he, what he also did was issue issue uh, an. Um, it, he challenged uh, Zuckertot for a match. Uh, at first, he said he challenged Zuckertort and Hoffer. Hoffer was the co-editor of the Chess Monthly. He said, "I play you both in a match together, and uh, I give you some points in advance if you want." But uh, uh, Steinitz was so uh, so enraged that he he, he wanted to, uh, uh, to 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 settle things in a match. Um, that match didn't take place directly but finally that 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 was the beginning of the negotiations for what finally would become the first match uh, for the world championship so in in this episode but also because it because it's it's a very nice uh, metaphor for the complete 
uh, book and for, for the complete period in which people really could struggle with each other about ideas and moves and openings and uh, and about the question who, who is the best uh, yeah, it's fascinating. These days, of course, it seems like they would be like fierce Twitter rivals. They would, they would have been going yeah. back and forth. But it's hard to project forward because, as you say, so much of it was dictated by the circumstances where they felt that they had to uh, to be advocates for, for their own skills and their own ideas. Um, and one thing I really enjoyed about the book, uh, in addition to sort of the big, the big story, um, is the the little mini mysteries that crop up the sort of um historical questions that you're not sure about for example whether blackburn had two uh illegitimate children and then there's this famous game uh grimshaw and steinitz which i recommend listeners you might be familiar with it when you see it but it's one of these games that we're not sure if it actually happened um so could you describe like uh i mean a a bit about the game but also like what your research uncovered about the historical context of this miniature where steinitz loses that may or may not have happened yeah yeah uh, f- first a minor point the zuckertort was the one with who might have had uh, to uh to uh two children oh but, sorry uh, yeah uh, sorry I meant but, go ahead uh, uh, yeah that's a very difficult story about uh, uh Grim- the the this so called this game Grimshaw Steinitz and uh, the funny thing about this about this in the in the chess base uh, mega base there's only one ba- one game of Grimshaw uh, beating Steinitz in 16 moves so I, I I make the, the remark that uh, uh, for for one game record that's that's uh, what more do you want uh, beating the world world number one in in um, in the 16 moves or something like that uh, but. Uh, Steinitz claimed the game was never played, that it was a, a, a fake game uh, uh, and that was made up to, to make a fool of, of him of himself. And uh, Steinitz was at the time living in London and, and Steinitz was a very special character uh, who easily made uh, enemies. And so at the time, he uh, 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 also in, in, in the period that the, the conflict with Zuckertort uh, played up, he had made a lot of enemies in London. Uh, and so he thought that this was a trick played upon him by his enemies, uh, this this game, that uh, uh, somehow they uh, they invented the game. Though Steinitz, uh, although Steinitz admitted there had been a game between him and Grimshaw, uh, but he claimed it was a completely different game. Huh. And... Well, it's it's uh, it's a bit uh, it's I I present it in my book as kind of conspiracy story, and uh, uh, and maybe it was a conspiracy conspiracy. Uh, uh, there are different opinions uh, on it. I think, uh, uh, and uh, and the Saltis thinks that it was a genuine game. Uh, he has a book, uh, uh, David versus Goliath, uh, in which Saltis says, well. Uh, uh, it really took place, and uh, Steinitz was so embarrassed by that game that he later tried to uh, to uh, deny it really happened. But uh, 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 I think Salter says something like, uh, "Well, eventually witnesses step forward and say yes, this was the game played." But those witnesses are not. I don't think they are that trustworthy. So it's really uh, it's it's a very. Uh, it's a funny, sto- f- very funny story, but it it fits in very nicely in in my complete in in, in my overall story because of, well, it, it nicely illustrates how Steinitz in his London years had to had to fight with all those enemies, uh, and that was also because I I mentioned uh, uh, those people had to fight for their uh, reputation and their ideas. But Steinitz generally fought very hard and he made a lot of enemies and he was also a, a, a bit a arrogant figure. And uh, uh, so so in in his struggle uh, for for for, uh, for uh, fighting for his status, uh, he went a bit far and that's why he so easily made... Uh, enemies and Zuckertot was a bit uh, was a better better liked in 
in the London chess circles. Uh, both were, of course, immigrants of Jewish origin who came from uh, Central Europe uh, to London. So they, they already had a difficult uh, uh, bit, bit difficult time there. Uh, and they were, were also professionals, which wasn't... Uh, uh, which made their life difficult as well. Uh, but well, th- this story very well il- illustrates how difficult Steinitz uh, had it in, in London. But uh, partly that was because his o- uh, it was his own fault, uh, I think. Uh, uh, so even if it is true that they tried to play a trick on him, uh, well, he, he somehow deserved it because <laughs> right. he made so many enemies that they did, it, did, did, did want to play this trick on him. But maybe the game is, is real. I, I'm, I'm, I leave it in the middle uh, yeah, I mean, it's more fun not to know in a sense. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and and to to your point about Steinitz's personality, it, it is fascinating. Like, I really, I don't know if enjoyed is the right word, because at some point in the book, you have like a, a two-page excerpt of Steinitz, like addressing an argument point by point. And as you said earlier, like, he just won't let it go. Like, he just goes mm-hmm. in such excruciating detail that it's painful to read. But it does give you give you appreciation for, for what their lives were like and... Uh, and and as you say, why why Steinitz was uh was n- not the most popular chess player at the time. Yeah. Um, so we've got another listener question, Willie, on the topic of the book. Uh, this one is from Eiko Hadari, longtime friend and supporter of the pod, um, and he says. First of all, I wanted to say that I'm also one of the big fans of your writings and research. Your style is sweet and fun to read. Your research is admirable. And your first book was also highly popular in Iran. Eko is Iranian, although he lives in the Bay Area. Uh, he's in, in California. He says, I've also been a big fan of Zuckertar and read the books by Jimmy Adams. Happy to see that you went into that much detail about the match with Steinitz. And his question is, A, what you, if you know what your next project would be, and B, since he lives in San Francisco, which has one of the largest uh, libraries of chess books in the United States, if he says if you ever need help researching a topic, he's happy to access those books for you, and I can put you guys in touch if uh, needed. But but do you know what your next project will be, Willie? Uh well, let me first answer that. Uh, I'm very happy to hear, of course, that even in Iran, my books are popular, that I haven't heard that before. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and also thank you for offering uh, your help. Um, well, I have div- uh, a few ideas about my next book. Uh, uh, well, last time I was in your show, I said something about... Uh, adult improvement yeah and that's still on my mind but i don't think that will be my next book but uh, i have several ideas uh, also a book in a bit in the style of this this book my last book but a bit uh, uh, slightly more modern history with maybe people like nimsovich and tarash uh, okay I'm thinking about, but and, and I'm also thinking about writing a book from a, a philosophy of science p- perspective, with several topics, which would be uh, also have some historical uh, uh, part. But uh, those are ideas I have at the moment. Uh, okay, I'm but you haven't with... started anything yet. It sounds like uh, I started reading. <laughs> okay, excellent. That's the first part. And how do you get your hands on on all of the books you need to read? Oh, well, that's that's rather difficult because I haven't got uh, uh, that big a library myself. Uh, I have some friends who have uh, uh, m- more books than I have. And uh, and fortunately, nowadays, a lot is av- available on Internet. Uh, so, for example, for my last book, I couldn't have written that uh, without everything that is uh, available on, on the Internet because... Uh, 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 especially all those old magazines, quite a few of, of them are available. So for that, for the ink war, I have I have uh, I have worked through a lot of a uh, lot of chess magazines, uh, really enormous amounts of uh, uh, well, a lot of almost everything you cannot use, but now and then you find something that fits in very nicely. But for that, you have to work through uh, really a lot of those magazines and. Um, 
Hadn't it been for the internet, I couldn't have write, uh, written such a book because I, unfortunately I don't have a big library with all those beautiful old books and, and magazines. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't either, unfortunately. I have my share, but uh, definitely uh, oh, one always wants more. Um, and Willie, I don't think we actually talked in our prior interview about your favorite chess books. I'm curious as someone who's so so well steeped in chess literature, if you have any uh, personal favorites. Um, well, some of the old books, maybe, although they are not that... Uh, 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 although I wouldn't recommend them for studying chess now, but for example, Code of Think Like a Grandmaster is for several reasons still a classic, although uh, I disagree with almost everything that's said in, in it. <laughs> right. I think yeah. it's still a classic uh, book. Also, Taraj, uh, uh, Meine 300 Schachpartien, uh, My 300 uh, Games of Chess. Uh, which is that's a classic, and I think it's still very good, uh, good read. Uh, a bit more modern, uh, uh, um, Jean Nunn, Secrets of Practical Chess, I liked a lot, and uh, uh, also a book, a bit typical book, Hans Kmoch, Kunst der Bauernführung, uh, that has been translated into English, but I don't know the the, the English title. Is that pawn power or a different? Yeah, pawn? the art of pawn pawn power or something oh, like that. Okay, I'm, I'm also a... has been really influential. Although I by now uh, don't have much faith in the project he is trying to uh, uh, to get done in that book, but still uh, uh, <laughs> a fascinating book. Uh, so that are uh, just a few books. Uh, okay. I, I have to. I have I to tell you, Willie. I'm on the record as a pawn power hater. I I tried to read it, and I read it um, as a kid. Or actually, mm -hmm. I didn't read it. Uh, Mike Shahadi, uh, who's a FIDE master, and was occasionally uh, presenting lessons for me. And international master Greg Shahadi actually showed us chapters from it um, mm -hmm. when I was a kid. But I tried to revisit it with a friend of the podcast, Neil Bruce, and we both found it <laughs> quite boring, I have to admit. But yeah, it's uh, it holds its place in history. Yeah, but it, 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 it was a book that had a big influence on me back then. And, uh, uh, and later I realized this idea of, uh, uh, well, this ambitious idea of all those different structures with special names. Uh, Okay, it, it didn't really work out, but okay, that's one, one. It had some influence, and that's also with the code of books and some other books, uh, uh, like you mentioned, Re the Reiti books. They are still they are very important, influential books. Although we nowadays, if you want to become a better chess player, I I would not advise. Uh, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't advise to read them. But uh, yeah, and are you keeping up with uh, the modern chess books? Uh, not really. But, well, today there's uh, so much, so many chess books are being published uh, every year. Too many, I would say. <laughs> uh, and it's very difficult to keep uh, track of all uh, all of them. Uh, so I'm not well versed in the latest uh, chess books. Okay. And what about, do you have a favorite player, Willie, of all time? No. Favorite modern player? <laughs> uh, no, not really. No, no, no. Very, um, you're very impartial. You're, <laughs> I guess it uh, help, helps yeah. you. Uh, um, and Willie, one other topic we didn't touch on. I was checking out your OTB career. I saw that you've, I mean, obviously being a top Dutch player who's played in uh, Vikante and, uh, you know, many of the, the top tournaments over there. You've gotten to play Jan Timmen, um, of course, uh, Sokolov, um, a lot of uh, the top Dutch players, Erwin um, do you Do you have a favorite memory from, from your own competitive career? Uh, well, against the, 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 those strong guys, I uh, generally did very poor, so <laughs> <laughs> not, not against them anyway. But, uh, well, I have some... Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I have a small database with uh, with uh, games and, f and game fragments that uh, that I cherish, and there is a lot of uh, lot uh, 
moments, uh, uh, games in them, but they are not not against very famous players. But uh, I think that was an advice I, uh, 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 Jesper Hall, I guess you know him. Yeah, Swedish uh, he trainer, had right? This, I, uh, this advice to younger players, uh, make a, d- a database with games and fragments uh, uh, titled something like My Most Beautiful uh, uh, Games or Fragments. And that's what I have done uh, uh, I started with that some years ago, and everything I'm, I'm really proud on, uh, I put in that database. I think it's a, it's it's very good advice uh, for everyone. Uh, um, in, uh, recently, I had a, uh, in a training group, I I mentioned this, and I also asked asked them from, well, give me your most beautiful combination you you ever played, or the the, the tactical fragment that you f- f- think was was really special and. A lot of players can can't come up with something in 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 that case because, uh, yeah, well, they never never uh, kept something. But but but, uh, well, we 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 play so many games and also unfortunately uh, most of them are not very good and uh, some of them are simply terrible. But now now and then so. We we play we do something we really are satisfied with, so I think it's a good idea to put that in a in a special database and uh, so I have my special moments. But uh, unfortunately, as I said, not against uh, the big guys. I had always uh, uh, trouble with them. I, I against all those players you mentioned. I made a few draws, but uh, lost almost uh, lost uh, the the great majority. Uh, Certainly understandable. Those guys are uh, are incredible chess players. Yeah. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you're very strong in your own right. Um, yeah. But but yeah, well, I like the. Sorry, go ahead. I, sorry, I, I once won a game against Jordan von Verest, and it was a very nice game. But I have to admit, he was still very uh, very <laughs> I, I, young yeah. at the moment. I would so. have guessed. Yeah, you got to play these champs when when they're young. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a strong <laughs> advice. Uh, yeah. And I, I do like the idea of sort of celebrating your wins because anyone who plays a lot over the board, you're certainly going to have your losses that sting and uh, it, it's easy to lose confidence. So it is nice. Uh, I like uh, Jesper Hall's idea of um, of uh, collecting your best moments, no matter mm-hmm. how modest they may be in the uh, the big picture um, of yeah. chess. Now, yeah, Willie, yeah. before this has been great, but before we let you go, we have one more listener question, and this one is from a fellow chess trainer, uh, David Lazarus, and he's just curious if you you if you count points when you're evaluating a chess position, like with the material bishops and knights being worth three and rooks being worth five, and maybe you could talk a little generally also about uh, evaluating positions because I feel like uh, it's being discussed more in the chess discourse recently. Yeah, I saw there was a book uh, which I haven't read uh, on on specifically on uh, evaluating. Yeah. Um, well, that's a that's a big big uh, topic uh, because uh, uh, as I told you before, uh, this t- traditional scheme of evaluating position, uh, uh, selecting candidate moves, and then start the. Uh, uh, some kind of thought process that uh, should select the best move. That's not my model. Uh, uh, my first book is titled "Move First, Think Later," and that already indicates that uh, these order, uh, the the order in our thinking process, is one of the major themes of that book. So actually, I don't think we f- uh, uh, think about positions like that, like evaluating. Uh, and then uh, find out the general plan and then fill that in with moves. Uh, so I think and uh, th- that goes, of course, uh, unconscious. Uh, you very quick, quickly get an idea of what the position is about. And uh, then already also very quickly moves come into your mind. Uh, and starting to work with that move, with those moves, help help you to evaluate the position. So it's 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 much more circular than uh, than uh, than that there is a specific order when you wherein you start with uh, with evaluating. Of course, there's a difference between uh, uh, positions you see in a book, 
you are completely new to and positions in your own games which you have built up yourself so if you're playing a game you already have an idea about what the position is about so this strange id in for example code of who i mentioned this idea that at some points in the game you should uh, take a take a good look uh, uh, pause for uh, for some time and uh, look at all those characteristics and then make a big plan uh, code of us of course uh, uh, the communist uh, ideol- ideology so we like to make, make big plans and then <laughs> smaller plans yeah. and uh, and finally the, the the best move comes rolling out uh, but that's that traditional idea I do not share at all so um, I think uh, if a chess player looks at the position it goes really fast and he recognizes certain things uh, and and, and directly connected with that are certain moves that uh, 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 capture your attention and you start working with that. So I all uh, like to say that uh, what works is so is so important for the right evaluation that you cannot separate them. So you cannot... So it all happens at the same time. Uh, so I'm not about... I, 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 some kind of conscious evaluation I never do actually. Uh, Interesting. I see in, well, I guess almost all players on the basis of what they already know, they look at the position and they recognize in in a split second uh, what they think it is about. And that goes for beginning players as well as very strong players. You have a certain amount of knowledge, you look at the position, you've got an idea what it is more or less about, or is it on that side, or is it happening on, on, on the green side? or uh, And for example, uh, you quickly think, well, maybe I can do something against this king. And you start, of course, you start looking at moves, and then maybe you, you quickly come to, come to the conclusion, well, it's not that much as I hoped for. Uh, so slowly, uh, uh, it's, uh, well... Uh, circular is maybe not the right term, but it's it's not a that clean process which starts with evaluating and ends with moves rolling out. So, uh, do I ev- evaluate the position? I, I, that's a difficult question. I'm not sure <laughs> if I ever do that in the traditional way. But as yeah, if you can if... look at the position and do don't see moves. If 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 you look at the position, you. Of course, you directly see moves because they're intrinsically uh, connected uh, elements of a position and effective moves. They are so much connected that you can't look at the position without directly spotting interesting moves. Uh, yeah, and okay, as you that say, was a long answer, but still not uh, only uh, very. Uh, partial and well so yeah i mean it does answer his question basically your answer is no you don't think about chess that way and if david hasn't read uh move first think later and actually i mean anyone listening um it, it's well worth a read it, i i as i mentioned in our previous interview you convince me of that way of thought but even if someone reads it and doesn't necessarily agree with your thesis i think it's uh good to challenge your assumptions and uh you certainly make some compelling points in it um so Willie, this has been uh, fascinating as always. I always enjoy and learn from from speaking with you. Um, b- before we say our goodbyes, do you have anything else to add? Um, well, yes, one small thing. I hoped you would ask, ask, ask what I expected you maybe to, to ask uh, for, because I just wrote a book about uh, the first World Championship uh, match in history. And... Uh, I thought maybe you're going to ask me if I don't regret, regret it a bit that this this beautiful tradition we have with this world championships ah. that it somehow is going uh, in the wrong direction. And I recently heard uh, uh, listened to a podcast with, uh, with a very interesting podcast with uh, Howard, Howard Burton, uh-huh. and he said something like, "Well, if if those uh, world championships are going to disappear, uh, well, that's not not." Uh, not that bad a thing. Uh, so I actually I thought maybe you <laughs> you're gonna bring well, that up because it's it's 
Well, one it says is the developments are going so quickly nowadays, but I do think that's a bit... Uh, we have this beautiful history. Uh, chess history in general is, is very interesting, but the, the all those world championships... They they make uh, they are an important part of our history, and uh, also uh, beyond chess, uh, the the chess domain uh, they are important like Fischer Spassky and uh, uh, well it's such a beautiful part of chess history and I happened to write a book about the the start of this beautiful tradition and now we are at the point that people are discussing the, uh, maybe. Uh, uh, we're not losing that much if 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 uh, if, the, if it stops or uh, and we have the the, the uh, I understand um, Magnus Carlsen has Carlson has some good reasons not to defend this title, but still I think it's a it's it, it's it's a pity that uh, he doesn't. Uh, I don't want to say anything ne- negative about his his reasons. He has his reasons, but still that. Uh, it's such a beautiful tradition. It's such a rich uh, chess tradition that. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, I thought you maybe might bring no, it up. No, no, you, you raise <laughs> maybe an you excellent have your point. own thoughts about it, but. Uh, yeah, no, and you've got plenty of company who feels that way, and I'm somewhere in the middle. I mean, as I mentioned with Howard, um, my problem is I sort of feel like it's um it's an unstoppable tide. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously Magnus being uh, the prime example of someone who. Um, no longer feels like it's it's worth, uh, as Howard said, the the time invested. Mm-hmm. Um, but even Fabiano Caruana on the C Squared podcast, of course, he's speaking openly about um, how how much, to be frank, how much easier and more relaxing it is to to play online, uh, to play faster time controls. And th- there is a part of me that's sad about it, but it's it's more to me like as howard mentioned if you look at other sports they're constantly changing the rules they're constantly tweaking formats and to me it's kind of it's sort of happening whether we like it or not so Mm -hmm. i feel like it's okay to be sad but there's not much we can do about it no i i think i agree with that it's a it's but but still uh, compared to other sports Sports, I think we have a speci- especially a very rich uh, tradition, which uh, I cannot uh, think of. Well, uh, I cannot think of another sport that has such a uh, rich tradition. And we were one of the first sports that uh, that had a, a world champion. So, um, and let okay, me ask but you, I, I see your I see your point. It's uh, yeah, and also let me ask you from from this perspective. Um, you know, the, as we record this again, the the world championship between Napolnici and Ding Loren is about a month away. Um, I'm preparing to cover it. Uh, I'll be doing a preview episode that may even come out before this one. Um, we'll we'll see about that. But I have to admit, from a personal standpoint, as a chess fan, I'm having a hard time getting as excited as I would for a normal match. I mean, if Magnus were involved and if I felt like it determined the best player. Do you feel that way as well, Willie? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. A- okay, and like I think one of the problems, uh, of course, is that Magnus is so strong, so incredibly strong that he has, that the gap between him and all the rest is maybe, yeah, is unfortunately, is it is that big that he doesn't feel um, uh, compelled to, uh, to, to, to defend his title. But, uh, uh, yeah, but indeed, it's... Uh, it's different with, without Magnus. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, but I cannot. Uh, I I would like to. Uh, uh, I I cannot say that to 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 Magnus from look at our rich tradition. You have to. I don't think he has to. But it's it's it, as you say. It's the way it goes. Yeah. I mean, and no one appreciates chess history more than Magnus. You know. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's so well read, and uh, you know eating, devouring the books about Soviet chess history. Mm-hmm. And uh, so for him to have made that decision definitely uh, speaks, speaks volumes. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, but, I see. but it, but it's, you know, it's not a black and white issue for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm part of me is sad about it as well, but when I look at it through the lens of this current match, um, it definitely highlights uh, w- why I feel like we, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Um, well, Willie, 
always fantastic to catch up with you. The book is called Ink War. Uh, again, highly recommend it for listeners. And if, if you're still listening and you're more interested in chess improvement and you have not read Willie's prior books, uh, those those are fantastic for chess improvement. Um, but stuff like uncovering these, um, these elements of chess history that uh, have been misrepresented and just telling these people's stories. I mean, I learned so much and I really appreciate that that you put so much work into these books. Thank you, uh, Ben. Uh, my pleasure. And whatever your next project is, I hope we can uh, discuss it whenever it uh, sees the light of day, Willie, as this one did. It may take me a while to read it, but I will eventually and we'll, we'll gladly discuss it with you when the time comes. I'll promise you I'll make a bit shorter book uh, the next time, uh, Ben. <laughs> um, sounds good. <laughs> no, no pressure. I will enjoy it however long. I just might need some help with, uh, with other work and household chores so I can read it sooner. But... Uh, mm -hmm. okay. but but thank you, Willie. Appreciate it as always. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. First and foremost to our producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. Got to thank the Patreon subs. Uh, Perpetual Chess would not be possible without you all. Uh, be sure to follow us on your social media of choice. I'm at BennyFischel1 on Twitter, uh, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram. You can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group and continue the conversation with interview subjects. To email me, it's ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And be sure that you are sub to the Perpetual Chess Link Fest. It is a Substack newsletter that you can Google to find. Every week I send out the best chess news stories that I have read the prior week, including lots of good chess improvement advice. Uh, so that should be everything. Thanks for listening, everyone. And we will catch you all next week.